Hello, this is William Liu of Formosan Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles. Today I want to share with you a song by the songwriter turned singer Paul Williams. The name of the song is Dream Away. Dream away, child. Let your dreams run wild, or a lifetime of worries might claim you. Dream away, child. Let your dreams run wild, or the years in the tear shed might tame you. I want to ask you, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Do you always look on the bright side of things? Do you smile more than you frown? Are you quick to compliment and say thank you? Or are you quick to complain and judge? Genuine Christians are people of hope and faith. The word gospel comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning God's story. In Mark 1.15, Jesus proclaims, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. King James says, Believe the gospel. The gospel or good news is defined as the gift of forgiveness of sins and being reconciled to God. ISBE, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, tells us that the gospel is the message of God that redemption is offered to all. The gospel is bound up in the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. The good news is more than just a one-time gift. The Bible tells us in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The gospel, the good news of God, is our power, the power of salvation to us who believe. We can rejoice that good will have victory over evil. Let's not complain or see the bad in our current house arrest. Let us give thanks in every situation. Let's praise God and worship God in good times and in bad times. Last, I want to share with you a few words from the song Good Grace by Hillsong United. So then, don't let your heart be troubled. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Good grace, good God, His name is Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again that you will have victory over evil. We pray, O oh Lord, as you are sitting on the throne in control of everything, that you would reign over us and over this situation. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
patiently. I've waited patiently upon the Lord, and He inclined and heard my cry. He pulled me up out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He gave me beauty for ashes and joy for my morning and praise for heaven. So good to me, so good, so so good to me, Jesus. So good, so so good to me, so good, so so good to me, so good, so so good to me, Jesus. Let's see that from the top again. I waited patiently. I've waited patiently upon the Lord, and He inclined and heard my cry. He pulled me up out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He gave me, He gave me beauty for ashes and joy for my morning.
title of our message is Jesus, Our Good Shepherd. Our scripture is John 10, 1 to 11. Once upon a time, a great king ruled over a vast country. There was something very strange about this kingdom. Everything was the same. The people ate the same food, drank the same drink, wore the same clothes, lived in the same type of homes. The people even did all the same work. There was something else that was really odd. Everything was gray. The food, clothes, houses, there were no colors. One day, a very beautiful bird flew from the west into a small village in this kingdom. The bird laid a yellow egg and flew off. People were fascinated because they only knew the color gray. Everyone wanted to see and touch it and they broke the egg. Inside was a yellow powder Anything that touched the yellow powder instantly turned yellow. Soon almost the whole village was painted yellow. The next day, the same bird flew, flew from the west and deposited a blue egg in another small village. Soon everything in this village was blue. This happened a total of seven times on seven consecutive days in seven villages. The king in the capital city, where everything was still gray, heard about these strange events and wondered what this sign might mean. He called in his royal advisors and asked them if anything happened like this in the past. They said many generations ago, the kingdom was ruled by a philosopher king. At that time, fighting and conflict was widespread in the kingdom. The philosopher king felt that the source of this fighting came from differences among the people. The king thought the only way to peace was to eliminate all the differences among the people. That is why the people did all the same things and everything was great. The present king was worried that the various colors in the villages would again lead to conflict and fighting. So he ordered the royal archers to find this magic bird and kill it. The archers found the bird and hit it with their arrows, but the bird simply flew away. The king said, if the bird can't be stopped, then the people must be stopped. He ordered the people to remove all the colors and return to gray. But the people loved the new colors and refused to obey. Dissension and conflict increased more and more. The king didn't know what to do. Then one day, the beautiful bird flew into the royal palace. It laid seven different colored eggs. In a fit of rage, the king hurled the eggs in all different directions. They burst into a beautiful spread of colors. The king was so inspired, he suddenly knew what to do. He realized that the bird was a sign that change was needed but he ignored the sign. After this, the king ordered that all the people can have all colors and all the people lived happily ever after. John Aurelio's book, Colors, Stories of the Kingdom, says the king was given a choice, follow the sign of God or ignore the sign and go your own way. His failure to heed the sign almost brought disaster for him and for his kingdom. Jesus gives us a choice. Will we enter life through him, the gatekeeper, or will we seek another road? Jesus tells us in John 10:1, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger in fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. 
Verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Twice Jesus tells us that he is the gate. George Adam Smith was a 19th century Bible scholar. He traveled to the Holy Land and came across a shepherd and his sheep. He talked with him at length and the man showed him the fold where the sheep were led at night. It was made of four walls with only one way in. Smith asked him, this is where they go in at night? Yes, said the shepherd. When they are in there, they are perfectly safe. Smith said, but there's no door. The shepherd said, I am the door. He was not a Christian man, but he was speaking from a shepherd's viewpoint. Smith looked at him and asked, what do you mean that you are the door? The shepherd said, when the light is gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in that open space and no sheep ever goes out but across my body and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. Jesus is our shepherd and he is the door. He is the gate that keeps us safe and protected. In John 10, 10b, Jesus says, I am come that they may have life and have it to the full. In the New Testament, there are three Greek words that refer to life, bios, pasuke, and zoe. Bios refers to life, physical life. Pasuke refers to the soul, thinking, feeling, and deciding. And zoe refers to eternal life, the life that flows from God alone. The Bibles for America.org tells us. When Jesus says that he's come to give us life to the fullest, he uses the word zoe, eternal life. He's not talking about living forever on earth. He's talking about living life to the fullest in this world and then living life to the fullest in a better world beyond the grave. Jesus is saying to you and me, I have come that you may have zoe and have zoe to the fullest. We need to have God's point of view. The God who created the universe wants to share his divine life with us. In our natural birth, we human beings possess only pasuke life and bios life, soul and physical body. But when we accept Jesus Christ and are born again, we're not just safe from our sins. We receive the divine life, zoe, into us. We are born again with the life of God. This life on earth may bring us, may offer pleasures, joy, temporarily, but it still leaves us hungry for some greater meaning or purpose. That is our hunger to know God. We are created in the image of God. We are created to know God and to live at peace with Him. We are created for purposeful work and creativity and relationships. All the blessings in the first chapters of Genesis. That's the life we were made for. Genesis 3.8 says, The Lord God walked in the garden with the man and his wife in the cool of the day. God is a God of relationship and he did this every day. When we get an emptiness inside of us that tells us this life is meaningless, let's not give up. Don't try to numb the pain. We need to acknowledge that this life on earth is not our true purpose. Sarah Miles was a chef and a journalist living in San Francisco. She was an atheist and had no interest in religion, or as she said, no interest in, in religious nuts. But one day she wandered into a local church where the priest was offering the Lord's Supper. Out of curiosity, 
Miles went up to the altar and received the bread and wine. It fed a spiritual hunger in her that she didn't even know she had. Since her encounter with Jesus and becoming born again, Sarah Miles made a radical change in her life. She has opened food pantries all over San Francisco. She's taken her faith to the streets, ministering to the poor and homeless, giving them food, and sharing the hope that she found when she found God. God does not intend for us to waste our lives chasing after pleasure or things. Eternal life, both in this world and the world to come, is one of God's greatest gifts to us. Our first point is that Jesus frees us from anxiety. John 10, 10, Jesus says that he has come to give us life and life abundantly. Philippians 4, 6 to 9, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Matthew 6, 25 to 26. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Having the life of Jesus Christ frees us from anxiety. Receiving God's gift of life gives us peace and can free us from worry. If we have God's presence in our hearts and in our lives, we can handle anything that comes our way. God created us in his image. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Anxiety is rooted in fear. Fear drives us to compare ourselves with others and to try to compete for resources. Fear drives us to protect our turf and try to control our circumstances. Fear causes us to put our own needs first above others. And so we remain in a constant state of anxiety. Author Max Lucado was talking to a native Hawaiian man who shared with him that Hawaiians refer to non-Hawaiians as haole. The native Hawaiian man said haole is a Hawaiian word for no breath. He said, our forefathers thought that the settlers were always in a hurry to build plantations, harbors, and ranches. To the native Hawaiians, they, the foreigners or the offlanders or the mainlanders, seem short of breath. They were always in a hurry to build something or to acquire something. Does that sound like most people we know? Sometimes we are the haole, the people with no breath. In contrast to people with no breath, look at the life of the late Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision. Millions of people all over the world have been fed, protected, educated, and sheltered through World Vision. Someone asked Bob Pierce how he created this organization. He said the turning point was when he prayed, Oh God, I give you the right to set the agenda for my life. From here on out, you're going to run the show and you can change that agenda anytime you want. But I pray that you would be pleased to use me in any way you see fit. Amen. Bob Pierce trusted in God and that set him free from the anxieties of this life. 
and thousands of people have been impacted by that decision when Bob Pierce gave his life to God's work. During World War II, FDR said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. President Roosevelt was trying to change the paradigm or the thinking of the people from despair to hope. Winston Churchill once said, we can make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. To follow Jesus means to be a person who gives. It is a paradigm, a worldview or perspective that changes the world. We can exhaust ourselves chasing after riches or success. What if we could let all that go and focus our best energy, time and resources on loving God, loving others, and making a difference in the world. Our first point was that Jesus sets us free from worry and anxiety. Our second point is that Jesus frees us for generosity. He gives us a spirit of giving. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Jesus fills us up with his love so that we can love others. If God loved us enough to give us his son, that same God will give us all that we need in this life. Dr. Barry Marshall saw many of his patients suffer and even die from peptic ulcers. In some cases, the patients have their stomachs completely removed. In other cases, the peptic ulcers turned into stomach cancer. The medical establishment in Australia believed, as did doctors in our own country, that ulcers were caused by stress. So their treatment involved anti-acids and relieving stress. But Dr. Marshall and his colleague, Dr. Robin Warren, did research that led them to believe that ulcers were caused by a common and an easily treated stomach bacteria, H period, pylori, P-Y-L-O-R-I. They wrote papers on their research, but the first medical journals they approached refused to publish them. When they finally got published, no major medical institutions paid attention. They couldn't get foundations to fund their research. Pharmaceutical companies opposed their research because these companies were making huge profits by selling various antacids. Doctors Marshall and Warren successfully healed patients' ulcers with antibiotics, and it saved these patients from a lifetime of pain or early death. But they couldn't get widespread acceptance Finally, Dr. Marshall decided to take drastic action. He made up an H. pylori cocktail and drank it himself. Within days, he was in terrible pain and constant vomiting. He developed a peptic ulcer. Then he treated himself with a course of antibiotics and it completely healed his ulcer. As a result, medical journals around the world began publishing the research of Dr. Marshall and Dr. Warren. They both were awarded the 2005 Nobel Prize for Medicine. Today, peptic ulcers are successfully treated and stomach cancer is rare in the Western world, all because one doctor decided 
to make himself sick to offer the world a cure. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus Christ is the suffering servant. He is the wounded healer. He became the Lamb of God who takes away our sin and the sin of the world. Are we listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd? Are we reading his word, meditating, and listening to his voice? Are we praying for healing and salvation for neighbors and people in the world? Let's also ask God to protect those on the front lines of fighting this pandemic. Some of you remember Michelle and Bert. Michelle is a nurse. Of course, you know Annie and Tim. Annie is a nurse also. We want to pray also for Dr. Emily, Agnes, Verna, Ivan, and Lisa, and all the others working hard. Generosity is rooted in faith. It overflows in joy. This is the kind of life that God created for us to live. Joy comes from putting Jesus first. Joy comes from focusing on the things of God. In God's presence, there's peace and joy and rest from anxiety and want. We all want more than an ordinary worldly life. That something more can only be found by giving your life to Jesus, our Good Shepherd, and by living in Him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for us. By your stripes, by your wounds, we are healed. So we pray that people might turn away from sin and call out to you and be saved. You would save us physically and spiritually because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.